welcome everyone. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. I'm actually even more thrilled to find out I'm I'm the first one. So you have nothing to compare it to. <laughs> but uh, my name is Eddie Phillips. I am Shield's cybersecurity evangelist. The cool thing about being a partner in a business is you can get to come up with your own title. So I like security, cybersecurity evangelist, really because I'm super passionate about educating small and medium businesses around cybersecurity. And I'm even more thrilled to be talking to an audience who has an interest in computers already, where some people see it as kind of as a, as a superfluous item they have to learn in order to protect their businesses. You guys are purposely choosing to be in a technology-based education. So absolutely thrilled to be here. Wow, where do I start? So I, I have about five minutes to introduce myself and talk about uh, my background, where I came from, my education, that sort of thing. So what I'd like to do is really take advantage of that because I don't know that I actually have a traditional education or background. So as was mentioned in my introduction, I'm from Dallas, Texas. And my first exposure to technology and what really got my attention and to go down this career path was when I was young, my uncle uh, used to work for a company called Texas Instruments. You probably heard of him. They actually own a calculator. It's most likely made by, by Texas Instruments. But they do a lot of other things too. In fact, today they, they make micro microprocessors and that sort of thing. But when I was a kid, he used to take me to work with them and, and I used to see all sorts of the, you know, obviously dated things back then, but it really, really sparked my passion for, for technology. However, I took a bit of a, a uh, jaunt down the rabbit hole and my parents ended up moving up to Canada. And so I went to high school here and when I went to high school, there was not a real great opportunity to learn about technology. I ended up taking a what's called a, a general studies major because there was no computer major. And I, and I knew even at that point you know, where I wanted to go with my career. And so I did take what I could. I did have a computer course. I took that, turned learned a little bit of programming, basic computer stuff, network, a little bit of networking. Uh, I took a typing course, probably the best thing I ever did. In fact, it actually leads me to a part of my story later on how I got my first IT job. So fine, I, I graduated high school. I, I wasn't a great student. I was an okay student. I probably should have paid attention more and studied harder. But uh, I ended up having my daughter at a very young age. And she's awesome. I love her. She's grown now. She's 25. But it certainly made my life a little bit more difficult. So to support my family, I basically took the, the first job I could out of high school and worked at a, uh, a window and door manufacturer. So it was really off the path of what I had envisioned for my life. And I worked there for, I guess, I guess two years, but I, maybe a year into this job, I went to work one day and started looking around and seeing people doing what I was doing, making not much more than minimum wage, building windows and doors. And they were in their like 50s and 60s. And this isn't a slam against anybody who does this, but it wasn't my passion. It wasn't where I saw my future. And so I knew I had to do something about it. And so I made a decision to continue my education. I signed up at, at Red River College to take some programming courses. And that was great. It, it, it fed into, uh, again, my education a bit so that I could maybe start changing my direction. So about a year later, uh, I took a trip back home to visit family and I took my, my family down there. And I ended up, uh, running into my cousin who actually got a job at Microsoft. Now this is 19, 1995, about this time of a year, maybe a little bit earlier. And Windows 95 was announced and it was about to be released. Now, Windows 95 probably doesn't mean a lot to you guys, but back then it was pretty revolutionary as far as the graphical user interface, the GUI, right? So it was huge. I mean, Max had been around, but it was a you know pretty small subset of, of computer users. But to have mainstream computing move to such a revolutionary user interface, but it was big. And Microsoft at the time was the 600 pound gorilla in the technology industry. I mean, there was no Facebook, there was no Google. They were pretty much it and on the bleeding edge of, of new technology. So I was thrilled to have this opportunity. So my cousin, just to get back to my story, my cousin said, hey, you should, you should apply for, to come work here. And com certainly compared to what I was doing, it was, you know, it was my light at the end of the tunnel. So what I did was as a contractor, I went and I applied and I had to pass, I had to pass two tests. 
<laughs> the first test was a Windows knowledge test. Uh, it was for the previous version of Windows, obviously, and it was pretty clunky, but I passed that no problem. The second test was a, a, actually a, a typing test of all things. And I hadn't even touched a keyboard in, in years, not since high school. And that was tough. <laughs> it was actually the hardest part of the, of the interview and the testing process. And what I found out, so what I got, I got there and I took, uh, I had the interview and I took the Windows test. I took the typing test and I failed. And I found out that there was no limit to the amount of times I could take this typing test. So here I was, I don't remember how many hours I spent at this testing facility, but I think I ended up taking that test like eight or nine times. And I would miss it by like one word per minute or, or one mistake. So, but finally I passed it. I got my job at Microsoft. I gave my couple of weeks notice to my job here in Canada and I moved back down to Texas. And that was the, again, the, the, the big start of my career in, into IT. And what a start it was, I was so influenced by Bill Gates and what Microsoft was doing and just the, you know, just the awesome camaraderie and the morale was fantastic down there. And it really changed, looking back, I, I guess, I guess it really changed my vision on how a company should be run and how employees should be treated. So I, I suppose for my employees now, you know, I, guess I need to give a lot of thanks to, you know, to, to where I started. Uh, after Microsoft, I actually did leave. Um, maybe, maybe one of the few regrets I have, I probably never should have left. It was uh, uh, for some personal reasons. I ended up getting a job at Texas Instruments. It was great. I, I learned a lot about making microprocessors, but I had to work in a clean room, which was not in my in my my career path vision at all. Um, so I, I ended up leaving there and moving back to Canada. I ended up at uh, AT and T, which was which is nice, which is a tough job to find in Winnipeg at the time. Was it was a decent technology job. After that, I went to a company called SHL System House which got bought by a company called EDS, which is a Texas-based company, ironically. And then they ended up getting bought by HP, the computer company. So they, they're they still around. I think they might've sold off that portion of business I used to work with, where we did a lot of outsourcing and support. Our major client was the Manitoba government. So I spent a, time, a lot of time over there doing disaster recovery, networking support and that sort of thing. Uh, in 2008, I started my own business. I left HP and started uh, Rep4 Technologies. It was an IT outsourcing business. So we did computer support end to end, including uh, cybersecurity, such as it was back then. And then in 2015, I merged my company with another company and I have two partners now and we form Shield Networks. So that's kind of how my career life went to end up to where I am now. Uh, so, th so then I ran operations in Shield Networks, handling the day-to-day -day stuff. I have an awesome team that is really dedicated and just as passionate as I am about you know, keeping our clients happy and keeping them secure. And then in last November, I changed positions and I began doing, doing this kind of stuff. Uh, cybersecurity awareness training for our clients, uh, a lot of the marketing. I now, do, I have a link on here, I think, for my Facebook. No, it's later on. Anyways, I, I do release a, a video every week-ish uh, just with little snippets of what's going on in the news and just some of the popular things that are happening in cybersecurity. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so I did talk a, a little bit about my family. And, uh, yeah, there's a picture of my family and I from way back in the day. I'm just kidding, it's not. I love to use that picture because my wife gets mad. Uh, here's our agenda today. I'm not gonna go through it right now. We'll, we'll hit them as we go along. But uh, I would say it shields the, the biggest questions I get and the most popular questions is around email threats. What we're seeing is 90% of the threats and the infections that come in are through email. So I spent a lot of my time talking about awareness. In fact, I'll probably beat that word to death during this presentation, but awareness is so key. So we have, we have technology solutions out there that I'm sure most of you are aware of through your course. You know, we have, we have firewalls and we have email security and we have desktop security, but because the hackers out there and the bad actors out there have run up against these walls, the technology walls, they've gone to attacking what we call the people, people firewall. So basically it's based on the knowledge and the defenses that we have as a society, as an individual to defend against things like social engineering. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So 
some of the items that you probably know about already around phishing and impersonation, uh, malware, infected payloads, those aren't new, but the way that they're doing is, is, is quite a bit different. So for example, phishing, uh, phishing, as most of you know, I did get to look at your curriculum. I was very impressed. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, terminology in there that I actually had to go look up. Things like, I never heard of uh, garbage collection before, at least not defined the way that it was defined there. So I thought, I think that's fa fascinating that you guys are getting exposure to that sort of thing. But uh, anyways, phishing is spoofing, changing the from address. As you likely know, you can, anyone with a half decent amount of technical knowledge can change the from address in an email. And if you don't have proper email security in, in place that looks at that from and where it actually came from, it can get through and you can make yourself look like anybody. And one of the most popular ones we see right now is the CEO scam. Uh, what, what I'm gonna do in this presentation is, because you guys are already invested in learning about this stuff, what I really wanna do is express what's happening in the business world right now, what's happening, like real life scenarios. Uh, so I'm hoping to add value to what you're already learning right now. So, so let's, we're going to go down that path. Um, and on the on the theme of phishing, and especially with everything that's going on right now with with the coronavirus or COVID-19, we are seeing that you know su surprise surprise uh, hackers and internet scammers are the, the scum of the earth. They're taking full advantage of what's going on right now. We're seeing emails come in with. Um, what looks to be COVID-19 information in a payload that looks like a PDF file, but it's actually ransomware or it's some sort of attempt to get your credentials. Uh, so we're, what we're doing is we're warning businesses to watch for things about where the URLs are coming from, links to the World Health Organization. If you really wanna go see the World Health Organization and what they're doing, we recommend going directly to their website we don't really recommend following links in emails because it's been a very popular way to trap people into going to malicious websites. Actually, I want to go back because I I'd actually skipped over something here. I wanted to dive into the CEO scam. Um, so the CEO scam is a scam where someone appears to be the CEO of a company, usually emailing the bookkeeper or whoever, whoever handles the finances. We actually had a company come to us the summer before last, because, and they told us a story about how their CEO went on vacation. And when they were on vacation, they posted on, on Facebook that they were on vacation. Their Facebook account was not locked down properly, so anybody could see it. Well, not two days after the CEO had gone down to, to on their vacation, the CFO of the company the chief financial officer received an email from supposedly the CEO urgently asking him to pay off an invoice that he had forgotten to pay. And it looked legitimate. In fact, the way that the CEO typed used a lot of ellipses. So an you know, ellipse is the dot, dot, dot after you, you know, if you type something like, you know, hey, Harry, how's it going? Dot, dot, dot. And, it, and this email had, the, had his signature. It typed in exactly the same way that the CEO did. And the CFO would have paid that bill, except there was two accounts he could have paid it from. So what he did is he actually picked up the phone and called the CEO, and the CEO was toward, you know, what, what invoice are you talking about? So it turned out it was a scam, but it was a very, very well done scam. So being aware of, you know, who you're receiving it from, if you're expecting it, and there's some really great rules of thumb we're going to go through. Last year, uh, we actually got a client out of this scenario. We were contacted, I'm going to change the names of the companies, but we got a, we were contacted by Everyday Company. Uh, Alice Jones reached out to us and she said, hey, you know, we had this, we had the scam go down and, you know, we're looking for some help. And what had happened was they had received, uh, or sorry, they had started a, a relationship with a company down in Australia. So th this was a very special, specialized uh, agricultural company here in Canada that sold a specialized crop, and they were working on a deal down in Australia. Anyway, so this relationship had gone on. They had been back and forth, sending, you know, working out the deal, and they finally came to a conclusion on this deal. And Everyday Company sent the details, an uh, invoice, and the details to wire transfer the money. And right after that was sent, 
the company down in Australia received a follow-up email almost immediately. It uh, looked like it came from Alice Jones. It had her signature. But it said, hey, you know what? I'm so sorry. We changed our financial information. Here's the new wire transfer info. And, of course, they had no reason to suspect it. They clicked on the link. They sent the money. And a couple of days later, Everyday Co. in Canada contacted Aussie Co., which is what we're calling the company down there, and said, hey, I thought we were moving forward with this deal. What happened? And they said, well, what are you talking about? We sent the money a couple of days ago. So we started digging in and doing a bit of forensics on this. And this is what we found. I don't know if anybody noticed between the two slides, but there were some major changes that easily slid under the radar if you're not looking for them. Unfortunately, because it was a wire transfer, Aussie Co. could not recover that money. Everyday Co. did save the contract. They ended up working out a new deal. But it just goes to show that if you're not watching out, that things like impersonation is what we call this. Not really phishing. We call it impersonation because anybody can go out and impersonate your domain in such a way that if you have a, a C and an L in your domain, it looks very similar to a, a lowercase d, right? So you can... You can register pretty much anything you want. And we're seeing a lot of this as well because people get so used to just you know, glancing over the, the addresses or the information they're being sent that they, that they fall for it. So I'm interested to know how many people actually caught that between the two slides. When I do these for our clients, typically one person out of about 20 actually catches that. And I uh, go out and once this is all over, go buy yourself a, a, a big bag of M&Ms. They usually carry a big bag of M&Ms and the winner gets it. I'm sorry, I can't do that today. <laughs> Anyways, more on impersonation. I talked about some of the most popular ways, replacing a W with two Vs, dropping an S. So, for example, RiversideInc.com um, versus RiversideInc.com. Very, very popular ways to, to combat that. And the worst part about this, I talked about, I talked about the phishing where you can, or sorry, the spoofing where you can actually change the address from the from. It's fairly easy with the right technology to catch that and to stop it, but the impersonation is a lot more difficult. There are some tools out there that are that are somewhat reliable, where you can actually um, you can actually add your most popular domains that you get email from, and it'll actually do a comparison to see if something comes through that's kind of similar. It's kind of clunky. Again, the best way is just being aware. And why are they doing this? What's the point of them sending these emails, sending these links, trying to get you to, to click on um, uh, uh, the files that they're including or click on links where it gets you to, to uh, open up a website? And ransomware is by far our biggest challenge right now. Uh, ransomware, I don't, I don't know if you guys, you guys probably didn't see it, but I spoke with CBC Radio the other day and two of the two big uh, Law firms in Winnipeg got nailed with ransomware, and they weren't able to recover. At least so far, they haven't. I don't, I don't know the latest on it. I don't know who the law firms are. They haven't certainly haven't reached out to us. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see that ransomware has been around since 2012, got more popular around 2014, but is now everywhere, and, and you know, some companies still aren't able to recover properly. And really, the recovery, and we'll talk about recovery options later on and how to defend, isn't really that difficult. It's just, have been, it's just being prepared. Now, the, the terrible part about the new ransomware these days, for example, Maze is a very popular one with hackers, is that not only does it perform a normal ransomware process, which is, let me elaborate on that, where, which is software that gets installed, malware that gets installed in your computer, it silently in the background runs while it encrypts everything, and then pops up with this message right, right here, and then you're, you're expected to pay them in order to get your data back. The stat changes quite a bit, but it sounds like only about 50 to 70% of the time um, you actually don't get your data back. Uh, now, the added twist there that I started to talk about was this malware and ransomware keeps you from your data, right? Because it encrypts it. You no longer have access to it unless you pay. But now with the newer versions, we're seeing that, for, for example, Maze, they steal a copy of the data first, then they encrypt it, and if you don't pay, they threaten to release the data publicly. So you can imagine, for some companies, maybe not a big deal, but a couple of law firms is definitely a big deal. If you do a search for Maze ransomware, there's lots of information out there, as well as some you know, really 
scary situations where, where data is going to release. Uh, so I want to talk about how the scammers and how what also called bad actors are getting around some of the great security um, technology that, that's out there. So here's what we do for our clients. We, we have something called Email Shield. And what happens is, as an email comes through the system, we look at the attachments and we look at, we actually scan the links. Well, actually, the system will actually follow the link to the website to make sure it's legitimate and to, to see if it's infected or has malware or has been compromised. But now what we're seeing is emails that look like they've come from Adobe and Microsoft. And in some cases, they actually have. So Microsoft has OneDrive, which I'm assuming you're all familiar with. You can use it for cloud storage. You can also use it for sharing files publicly. And at times, the files are actually legitimate. Or oh, sorry, the services are legitimate. So you click on the link to go to OneDrive or to Adobe also has a service that's similar. And the file itself is actually infected. So it's not the service that's hosting it, it's the file itself. They've also used very similar tactics in order to harvest credentials. So in this example I have on the screen right now, one of two things will, will be happening. A, they'll go to a legitimate Microsoft or Adobe or Google site, and then the file that they're accessing is actually infected, and then we'll spread the ransomware. Or they'll go to a site that looks like it's a legitimate Microsoft site, especially three, Office 365, which is extremely popular and a great service. I'm not knocking that at all. In fact, all of our partners use it. But you still have to be aware that people are taking, or hackers are taking advantage of the fact that they can create fake websites that look like it's Office 365 just to harvest your credentials. And we're going to talk about great ways to defend against those. But then what happens is it propagates the whole system, right? So just pretend for a second that you are, even if you're not the CEO of a company, if you're an employee of a company and you accidentally click on one of these links and you put in your credentials for Office 365, suddenly whoever's put up that fake website now has access to your email and all of your contacts. So they'll start emailing you know, emailing your peers and your business in order to get them to click on further links. And now it's it's actually your, your legitimate email. So there's actually nothing to be aware of other than the fact that they're sending you <laughs> potentially bad links or bad files. So there's all sorts of security risks uh, that we're going to, again, we're going to talk about how to, how to keep those from happening. But those are all items that are still active out there. And if you're not taking the proper, proper security actions, you're, they're still getting nailed. Uh, so just a couple more examples of just being aware of what you're clicking on for, for um, infected links. Um, basically, hovering your mouse over everything from email addresses to links in your email to website links will tell you usually the truth about where you're going. Uh, this was a link that we were sent. Uh, it was to one of our manufacturers, but yet if you look at the link, it's something to do with dentists. So obviously they're they're recycling some of their some of their malicious websites and malicious files, and uh, in in order to make it look like again it's it's a trusted site when in reality it's not. Some web browsers out there are getting a little bit better about helping protect us. Um, I don't really rely on these too much. I'm really glad they're doing it, uh, but the problem is is that like most other uh, most other cybersecurity technology is very reactive, so it's certainly not enough. I still recommend having uh, desktop security and network security, especially at a business at home. Um, supposedly, Microsoft's Defender is getting better, but internally, we use a product called the Sentinel One. Uh, we're also looking at a new product, uh, at least new to us, called Sophos Endpoint. Uh, so far, so good. They actually have the ability, we haven't tested it yet, but they actually have the ability to roll back uh, ransomware infection, at least on your local PC. If it reaches out to your network files, you're out of lock, you're, you're going back to, to backups. But um, yeah, the, the products out there, you know, they're, they're trying to keep up and we applaud them and we support them and, and they're our partners. Uh, but again, a lot of it still comes back down to, to being aware of what you're clicking on because it's, it's never ending battle, right? Uh, so yeah, so email attack prevention, I, I talked about that already. Uh, I talked about what we're doing as far as scanning the, the links and the attachments that are being included. I won't go over that again. And so here's here's our red flags. Here's what we're telling people to be really, really aware of and that's suckering in so many people. And, and, and I say suckering in, but I don't mean that necessarily in a negative connotation because if you think about it, the 
industry of hacking and scamming through cyber means is huge, huge. Billions of dollars are being made. So they have every every interest and every uh, inspiration to go out and make their attacks as as uh, effective as possible. Uh, and I think probably the, the biggest thing to happen for these attackers is ransomware because you can attack anyone with an email, whether it be a home user that might have precious um, pictures or, or, you know, you haven't saved your game in a long time. <laughs> Anyways, but but it, it can, or all the way to a CEO who has access to everything and it locks down all the files. So they really you know, made it very, very efficient. Uh, urgency, uh, oh, sorry. So be careful, financial transactions, anything that's asking you to, to give money, send money, pay an invoice, should have a red flag on it. Urgency, we see that a lot where, you know, please do this now, or if you don't do this, you're going to lose your data or lose your account. And people panic, right? We're, we're all human beings. Nobody wants to be in a position where they are frantic, where they are, um, where they are, you know, going to be in a position that they might be negatively impacted by their job, by society or anything else. So what happens is we put that logical part of our brain on hold while we deal with something that's urgent and we begin to re react emotionally. And that's exactly what they want. And one thing that I'm sure you guys know, in generally speaking, unless you're going between the same system, email is, is clear text. So I always have to warn our clients, don't send personal items, don't send your credit card information, don't send anything through email to an external party that you would not want published on the internet. And usually I get some, some gaps in there. So it's, it's, it's a good thing to keep in mind. Web threats, I've touched on them before. Nothing really new here. You know what, even, even legitimate websites get hacked. It's, it's being aware, it's trusting no one. <laughs> it's, it's being cognitive of the things that you're clicking on and where you're going. And then I think I, yeah, I have, I have another slide later on that, you know, that shows what some of the desktop security um, software and applications try to do to, to protect you. And I think some of the worst things that can happen is going to a site that you go to all the time and it coming up with a warning and you're ignoring it because, oh, I know this website, I, I go there all the time. But again, even legitimate um, websites can be hacked. I, I do want to br briefly mention Internet of Things. I, I love my line in here. IoT is the techno jargon way of saying equipment or other, other than computers connected to the Internet. We see uh, so many businesses plugging, especially manufacturers, plugging, you know, their refrigerator, everything in their refrigerator into the into the internet. Uh, even at home, right? People are plugging, you know, they've got cameras that are accessible from the internet. They have um, their, you know, their Google Homes. Their, you know, so many things that are exposed directly to the internet and are not, and are not separated from their computer. So once the once these items get compromised. It leaves them open. I don't know if you guys saw in the, in, a, in a big deal in the news a couple of months ago was the uh, security cameras that got hacked into, and, and these hackers were spying on them and them and their kids in their home. So there are ways to secure that. It's just keeping in mind that, and there's too much to go into right now, but there are ways to segregate those items from your regular network, and I highly recommend that. It's and the problem is that they made it too easy to plug just about anything into your router and get internet access. And too many of these manufacturers and vendors don't take security into, into mind. Social engineering, just to touch on this, uh, outside of the computer necessarily, but we are, I'm sure you've heard about, or, or your parents have, have certainly received calls about fake uh, CRA, uh, account of revenue agency phone calls, telling them that their social insurance number has been compromised. Calls from, and I've even heard about Minotaur Hydro ones, the fake Microsoft tech support, Phone calls, yeah, it's uh, it's crazy out there, right? It's it's again going on to the same basic theories about urgency or making you feel like you're going to get negatively impacted and you react emotionally instead of logically. Yeah, this is further is another screenshot from the fake uh, fake tech support where they pop up in your computer and it says, oh, you're being infected or you've got some sort of a problem with your computer. Please call us right away. Yeah, some of, the, some of the biggest scams out there. And the great thing about these is that well, the terrible thing is they look real. The great thing about them is, in most cases, generally speaking, these aren't actually, nothing's actually infected. You reboot your computer, it goes away. We had a lot of calls on these, um, at least we were in the last summer. 
Not if, but when. So one thing I left out of my career path that I talked about, I actually was a rodeo bullfighter for 12 years in my spare time. That's me actually getting bored by the bull. <laughs> we have a saying in rodeo, uh, especially bull riding, that it's not if you get hurt, it's when and how bad. So I've adopted that. I use that all the time in, in, uh, when I'm speaking to people and some of my social media stuff. It's not if you get attacked uh, by a cybersecurity threat, but it's when and how bad. Preparation is everything. And you think I, I put this presentation together, prevention and recovery. So we have a cybersecurity checklist that we share with our clients that we go over and potential clients in order to really generate some great discussion. If you guys are interested in that, I'd be happy to share it with you. So there's my email address. Uh, reach out to me um, or, um, or I can actually share it with the class. Uh, it's, it's a great little checklist. Yeah, the first page goes through some really ideal things to, uh, to consider when setting up a network and securing um, a business. Even some home users, some, some of it might be a little bit beyond you know, overkill for a home user, but still a great piece of document just to go over. It's really, really straightforward. It's a checklist on one side and then an explanation on the, on the, on the flip side. Uh, recovery checklist. Uh, I don't know how much of disaster recovery and, and backups you guys have gone over yet, but um, yeah, lo lots of great conversation pieces here. Uh, how to store your files, how to make sure that they're what's called air gapped from your computer. So if your computer gets infected, the infection can't hit your backups. And here's something I like to share with everyone. And these are things that you can do right now. Like get out of this presentation. And if you're not doing these, do them right away. Enable two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication, for those that don't know, is a secondary code that you provide when you log into any kind of a service, like your Google account, your Apple account, your Amazon accounts. You know, just about everyone now, nowadays uses a, or offers a two-factor authentication um, feature. Now, I know in the news in the last little bit that two-factor authentication isn't perfect, but you would have to be seriously worth a hacker investing the time in order to what they call port your cell phone, which actually we're going to talk about in the next point. I still highly suggest enabling two-factor authentication. Uh, Google uh, Google Authenticator is the app that you can use. There's a bunch of them out there, uh, but this one's quite popular. Enable it. You won't be sorry. If you have a Twitter account, any kind of social media accounts, make sure you enable, two, enable two-factor authentication. So when we talked about earlier, when we talked about scamming uh, the user credentials for Office 365, which we, we see happen for uh, businesses, this would put a stop to that. So, so if someone, even if someone gets your user ID and password, if they can't provide that code, they can't use your email. So that's our biggest defense right now against other than education and keeping them from clicking on the links in the first place. Secondary is two-factor authentication. Securing your cell phone. This is really, really big and a really, and I talked about, I've got a couple of videos if you go to my, our YouTube channel on there. I talked about this twice. The first time I talk about it, I talk about a, an investor. I think he's in New Jersey or something. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he invested in Bitcoin. He had his apps on his phone. And what they, what happened was that someone called up the cell phone company, pretended to be him and allowed them, the hacker to port his cell number to a different phone. So suddenly by all intents and purposes, you know, they had his cell phone without actually physically stealing it. So then they were able to access using 2FA and, and intercept the, the text messages. They were able to infiltrate his Bitcoin and he lost like $23 million. So I shared that video at first and most people are like, well, I don't have $23 million. I'm not going to worry about it. But I do another video about a lady. And this is one of many, many examples who had the exact same thing happen. And she didn't, you know, she was by no means a millionaire. She just had an Amazon account and her account was compromised and they ended up ordering several thousand dollars on her credit card through, through Amazon. So it was a hassle for her to get her phone back. So my recommendation here is to call your cell phone, cell phone provider and set up a pin or support password. And that way that if someone calls up, you know, they interrogate them, they ask them you know, for the pin and password. If they don't have it, then you know they can't port your, your phone number. Otherwise they ask for simple things that are on your bill, like your your email address or your your postal code or your app, you know, things like that, which are easily, easily available. Uh, password management app, I uh, highly recommend those. The worst thing, you know, here's the, the worst things you can do. Create simple passwords, create passwords with incrementing numbers or reuse passwords. Because what we're seeing 
is that when people's passwords get compromised, the hackers are then taking that password and that email address, and they're going and they're trying other services. So if, 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 if they somehow manage to get your Google password, they're going to try it in Twitter or, or Facebook or Instagram or whatever else. Summary in the future. I need to, I really need to update this slide because um, it, it's getting... It's, these are not really the future. This is happening right now. We're seeing... Oh, it's so funny thing. But the first thing I mentioned here is hospitals. I don't know if you guys, if you guys heard, but um, a couple of the big hacker groups actually came out and said, you know what, during this whole COVID-19 thing, we're going to stop targeting hospitals. Uh, it doesn't look like they all have done that because I heard about a hospital that got hit recently. But generally speaking, they said, well, we're still going to hit everyone else, <laughs> but we're not going to hit hospitals. It's kind of funny, I guess, honor amongst thieves in a way. But uh, anyway, it's this huge... Um, Municipalities have been hit. A uh, local furniture company in Winnipeg was hit last summer. I already talked about the, the law firms that were hit uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, this isn't going away anytime soon. I really do believe, though, that we can put a huge dent in this. I mean, I talked. To, we talked about prevention and recovery, but the easiest way to, to recover from ransomware is just to have a proper disaster recovery and backup plan. We were one of our clients were, was actually hit back in the end of 2014 with ransomware, and this wasn't just you know they encrypted all their data, and this wasn't just like a little bit of data. This was three terabytes of active data they were using. This company does a lot of design work. They build catalogs, and three terabytes was hit. And I was down in Boston for a um, a, a seminar. So, of course, I mean, we didn't have a team here, but they, they ended up, because of the emergency, they called, called us up directly and said, hey, we're, we're locked out of our data. And at that point, ransomware wasn't super popular. But at the end of the day, we basically scrubbed all the encrypted files. We turned to our backup system and restored. We had them up in a half a day. So it really, I can really get on a soapbox and talk about uh, prevention and recovery, especially when in, in those cases, it can be so straightforward. So Maze now is a little bit different when they start leaking the data, but actually recovering your business from ransomware really isn't that hard. There's technology out there that we can actually recover someone in as little as two hours if they need it. Uh, typically speaking, it takes about a day, but yeah, it, it's, it's really frustrating to still see businesses get so impacted. Uh, better tools, I already talked about the desktop uh, security software that we're seeing that can actually roll back local ransomware infections. But awareness, this is this is never going to go away. Cybersecurity awareness training, you know, it, there's job security there, that's for sure. As, as, but in, in the education part of it, as well as the technology part of it, because these, these, these scammers, these hackers, these bad actors, they are not going anywhere. And if you guys have any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, totally open to them right now. I have a few questions here. Um, awesome. I have one question that is asking, what is your favorite browser? an operating system for security. And I'm going to add an addendum onto that because I think that um, it'd be good to ask for almost like a desktop operating system and then a mobile operating system because they're, they're very different when we're talking about security as well. Yeah, that's the truth. So if I could, so I mean, this is a really tough question. So personally, if I could, I'd be using Linux um, all the time. And not that there's nothing out there that's affecting Linux, but uh, there's a term called uh, security through obscurity. And that's part of it. Um, also, the popularity of Linux when it comes to CEOs and uh, everyday users, it, it just isn't there. So realistically, uh, we're a Microsoft shop. We're a Microsoft partner. 90% uh, of our clients use Windows 10 specifically. Uh, the other portion uses Macs. So I have to be well versed in um, in Microsoft Windows, obviously, just because the majority of our clients use it. As far as a browser goes, on my on my PC, on my laptop that I'm using right now, I've actually switched to the new edge. And the only reason I switched to the new edge, I hated edge when it first came out. The only reason I switched to it is because now it's based on Chrome. Uh, and it just, it just, it flows a bit better. It meshes a bit better with Windows, but the core is now a Chrome core. 
I think you just started uh, a war in <laughs> I know, my I class. I knew, I, I knew that was a loaded question. Yeah, uh, we've had two years of one student saying that Edge was the best browser and everybody else saying that Chrome was better. <laughs> and yeah. so, so uh, if you'd asked me if you'd asked me a month and a half ago, Edge wouldn't have even been on my radar. Um, but because now it's the, basically the same core um, or sorry, same kernel, uh, it, it's it's yeah. That's the only reason I switched to it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so another question asks, uh, what resources do you recommend for maybe them learning since they have a lot of time at home? Um, that don't cost a lot of money. Is there things that you would recommend them kind of looking into and, and learning from with them having to quarantine at home? Oh, man. Yeah, there are so many resources out there. Uh, so there is, you know what? Let's, uh, I'll mention a couple right now, but if, if, um, if you want to send me an email about that one, I will put together some really awesome stuff out there. So there's, so first off, there's a ton of books out there on network assessments and cybersecurity if you want to go that direction. But if you are on Twitch, there are a ton of uh, really good white hat hackers out there. Uh, in fact, I've got one that I, I haven't tuned into him for a little while, but I like to, to throw him on while I'm working. And he'll actually run through some, some really cool stuff like the, the hack the box competitions. He'll talk about the latest threats and he'll actually do some white hat hacking, meaning that I'm sure you guys know, but white hat hacking, meaning that he's not actually causing damage. He's not stealing anything. It's all, um, it's white hat. So they're, they're the good guys. And usually they help out uh, cybersecurity companies like us versus black hat, which is the, the malicious guys. So yeah, there's some really good guys on Twitch. I, I can't remember his username off the top of my head, but if, yeah, if you want to send me that email, I'll send you that. Uh, there is, there are some great, um, there's, I'm trying to remember the name. I just signed up. Let me just check my phone here. If you go to uh, where is it? Pact, P A C K T Publications, uh, they have, I can't, I'm not sure how much it is monthly. They do have a free trial, but they've got a ton of books and they've got a really good book on network assessments and, and what's called penetration or pen testing for cybersecurity. Uh, that's definitely taking it to the next level, well beyond the scope of this presentation or this type of thing. But if you really want to learn more about cybersecurity and how that works in the background, and if you really want to geek out, those are some great resources. Okay, okay well, I think that I can say uh, thank you very much for uh, being a guest teacher for our grade 10 class. Uh, I think that that was a really good talk, and I think that they could take a lot out of it. So uh, I really appreciate you spending the time. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Again, I, I hope there was value there. If you guys have any feedback or any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely open to, to receiving those. Awesome. Thanks, Eddie.